Morning and okay. so welcome to our Tower School story time for the 11th of May. Great to have you with us. Today we're going to be reading a story called Stanley Paste. Then we're going to continue on with George's Marvelous Medicine. I hope you guys all had a great weekend and that you treated your mums really well, um, seeing it was Mother's Day yesterday. But first, the story, had it upside down for a moment, of Stan Stanley Paste. Stanley Paste was small. Like, really small. He was too small to be picked for sports and too small to defend himself. That's pretty mean. And they were the least of his problems. Uh-oh. He's trying to reach up to the toilet door. Oh, dear. I hate being small, cried Stanley. <laughs> there he is, just there, trying to watch a movie. I hate it, I hate it, I hate being small! But, was that, but there was absolutely nothing he could do about it. Then one day a new girl arrived at Stanley's school. Her name was Eleanor Cabbage. And guess what? She was the tallest person Stanley had ever seen. How wonderful to be so tall, thought Stanley. But then a gaggle of girls crept up and whispered in the new girl's ear. And Eleanor Cabbage ran across the playground crying. I hate it, I hate it, I hate being tall! Stanley Paste couldn't believe his ears. But why, he asked. Those girls call me a giraffe, said Eleanor Cabbage. I always get called horrible names. I get called horrible names too, said Stanley Paste. I wish I was small like you, said Eleanor Cabbage. I wish I was tall like you, said Stanley Paste. And from that day on, they were inseparable. And a funny thing happened. When the two of them were together, they just didn't seem to have any problems. In fact, when they were together, everything felt just right. Eleanor didn't get care of it didn't care about being teased, and Stanley always got picked for sports. And even though Eleanor Cabbage sometimes still wished she was smaller, and Stanley sometimes still wished he was taller, somehow it just didn't seem to matter any more. That is a really cool story of friendship. I really enjoy that one. All right. George's Marvelous at Medicine. The cook-up. So George has got a horrible granny. He's been all around the house to try and gather stuff for his marvelous medicine. And now he is cooking it up. In the kitchen, George put the saucepan on the stove and turned up the gas flame underneath it as high as it could go. George, came the awful voice from the next room. It's time for my medicine. Not yet, Grandma, George called back. There's still 20 minutes before 11 o'clock. What mischief have you been up in there now? Granny screeched, I hear noises. George thought it best not to answer this one. He found a long wooden spoon in a kitchen cupboard and began stirring hard. The stuff in the pot got hotter and hotter. Soon the marvellous mixture began to froth and foam. A rich blue smoke, the colour of peacocks, rose from the surface of the liquid and a fiery, fearsome smell filled the kitchen. It made George choke and splutter. It was a smell unlike anything he had smelled before. It was a brutal and bewitching smell, spicy and staggering, fierce and frenzied, full of wizardry and magic. Whenever he got a whiff of it up his nose, firecrackers went off in his skull and electric prickles ran along the backs of his legs. It was, a one, it was wonderful to stand there stirring this amazing mixture and, and to watch it smoking blue 
and bubbling and frothing and foaming as though it were alive. At one point, he could have sworn he saw bright sparks flashing in the swirling foam. Then suddenly, George found himself dancing around the steaming pot, chanting strange words that came into his head out of nowhere. Fiery broth and witches brew, froth, frothy, foamy froth and um, riches blue, fume and spume and spoon drift spray, fizzle, swizzle, shout, hooray, wash it, sloshing, swashing, sposhing, hear it, hissing, squishing, spissing, grandma better start to pray. The next chapter, brown paint. George turned off the heat under the saucepan. He must leave it for some time to cool it down. When all the steam and froth had gone away, he peered into the giant pan to see what color the great medicine now was. It was a deep, brilliant blue. Needs more brown in it, George said. It simply must be brown or she'll get suspicious. George ran out and dashed into his father's tool shed where all the paints were kept. There were a row of cans on the shelf, all colors, black, green, red, pink, white, brown. He reached for the can of brown. The label said simply dark brown gloss paint, one quart. He took a screwdriver and prized off the lid. The can was three quarters full. He rushed it back to the kitchen. He poured the whole lot into the saucepan. The saucepan was now full to the brim. Very gently, George stirred the paint into the mixture with a long brown spoon. Aha, it was all brown. A lovely, rich, creamy brown. Where's that medicine of mine, boy? Came the voice from the living room. You're forgetting me. You're doing it on purpose. I shall tell your mother. I'm not forgetting you, Grandma, George called back. I'm thinking of you all the time. But there are still 10 minutes to go. You're a nasty little maggot, the voice screeched back. You're a lazy, disobedient little worm. You're growing up too fast. George fetched the bottle of Grandma's real medicine from the sideboard. He took out the cork and tipped it all down the sink. And then he filled the bottle with his own magic mixture by dipping a small jug into the saucepan and using it as a pourer. He replaced the cork. Had it cooled down enough? Not quite. He held the bottle under the cold tap for a couple of minutes. The label came off in the wet, but that didn't matter. He dried the bottle with a dishcloth. All was now ready. This was it. The great moment had arrived. Medicine time, Grandma, he called out. I should hope so too, came the grumpy reply. The silver tablespoon on which the medicine was always given lay ready on the kitchen sideboard. George picked it up. Holding the spoon in one hand and the bottle in the other, he advanced into the living room. Grandma gets the medicine. Grandma sat hunched in her chair by the window. The wicked little eyes followed George closely as he crossed the room towards her. You're late, she snapped. I don't think I am, Grandma. Don't interrupt me in the middle of a sentence, she shouted. But you'd finish your sentence, Grandma. There you go again, she cried. You're always interrupting and arguing. You really are a tiresome little boy. What's the time? It's exactly 11 o'clock, Grandma. Your line is here, Joel. Stop talking so much and give me my medicine. Shake the bottle first, then pour it, pour it into the spoon and make sure it's an old spoonful. Are you sure you're going to gulp it down in one go? George asked her. Or will you sip it? What I do is none of your business, the old woman said. Fill the spoon. As George removed the cork and began very slowly to pour the thick brown stuff into the spoon, he couldn't help thinking back upon all the mad and marvelous things that had gone into making, into the making of this crazy stuff. The shaving soap, the hair remover, the dandruff cure, the automatic washing machine powder, the flea powder for the dogs, the shoe polish, the black pepper, the horseradish sauce, and all the rest of them, not to mention the powerful animal pills and powders and liquids and the brown paint. Open your wife mouth wide, Grandma, he said, and I'll pop it in. The old hag opened her small wrinkled mouth, showing disgusting pale brown teeth. Here we go, George cried out, swallow it down. He pushed the spoon well into her mouth and took the mixture down her throat. Then he stepped back to watch the result. It was worth watching. Grandma yelled, Owie! And her whole body shot up, whoosh into the air. It was exactly as though someone had put an electric wire underneath her, her chair and switched the current. Up she went like a jack in the box, and she didn't come down. She stayed there, suspended in midair, about two feet up, still in sitting position, but rigid, now frozen, quivering, the eyes bulging, the hair standing straight up on end. Something wrong, Grandma? George asked her politely. Are you all right? Suspended up there in, in space, the old girl was beyond speaking. The shock that George's marvellous mixture had given her had been, had been tremendous. You'd have thought she had swallowed a red-hot poker the way she took, up, took off from the chair. Then she came down again with a plot back into her seat. Call the fire 
fire brigade, she shouted suddenly. My stomach's on fire. It's just the medicine, Grandma, George said. It's good, good, strong stuff. Fire, the old woman yelled. Fire in the basement. Get a bucket, man, the hoses. Do something quick. Call it, Grandma, George said. But he got a bit of a shock when he saw smoke coming out of her mouth and out of her nostrils. Clouds of black smoke were coming out of her nose and blowing around the room. My golly, you really are on fire, George said. Of course I'm on fire. She yelled, I'll be burned into a crash, I'll be fried like a frizzle, I'll be pulled like a beetroot. George ran into the kitchen and came back with a jug of water. Open your mouth, Grandma, he cried. He could hardly see her for the, sm <laughs> see her for the smoke, but he managed to pour half a jugful down her throat. A sizzling sound, the kind you get if you hold a hot frying pan under a cold tap, came up from deep inside Grandma's stomach. The old head bucked and shied and snorted. She gasped and gurgled. Spouts of water came shooting out of her and the smoke cleared away. The fire's out, George announced proudly. You'll be all right now, Grandma. All right, she said, all right, it's all right. There's Jackie Jumpers in my tummy, there's squiggles in my belly, there's baggers in me bottom. She began bouncing up and down in the chair. Quite obviously, she was not very comfortable. You'll be fine. It's doing you a lot of good, that medicine, Grandma. George said, good, she screamed, doing me good, it's killing me. Then she began to bulge. She was swelling and was puffing up all over, like someone was pumping her up. That's how it looked. Was she going to explode? Her face started to turn purple and then green. But wait, she had a puncture somewhere. George could hear the hiss of escaping air. She stopped swelling. She was going down. She was slowly getting thinner again, shrinking back and back slowly to her old shrivelly self. How's things, Grandma? George said. No answer. Then a funny thing happened. Grandma's body suddenly gave a sharp twist and a sudden jerk, and she flipped herself clear out of the chair and landed neatly on her two feet on the carpet. That's terrific, Grandma, George cried. You haven't stood up like that for years. Look at you. You're standing up all on your own, and you're not even using a stick. Grandma didn't even hear him. The frozen pop-eyed look was back on her face again. She was miles away in another world. Marvellous medicine, George told himself. He found it fascinating to stand there, watching what it was doing to the old hag. What next, he wondered. He soon found out. Suddenly, she began to grow. It was quite slow at first, but a very gradual inching upwards, up, 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 and inch by inch, getting taller and taller. About an inch every few seconds, and in the beginning, George didn't notice it. But when she passed the five foot six mark and was going up on towards being six feet tall, George gave a jump and shouted, Hey, Grandma, you're growing, you're growing up. Hang on, Grandma, you better stop now or you'll be hitting the ceiling. But Grandma didn't stop. It was a truly fantastic sight, this ancient scrawny old woman getting taller and taller, longer and longer, thinner and thinner, as though she were a piece of elastic being pulled upwards. When the top of her head actually touched the ceiling, George thought she was bound to stop. She is growing taller. But she didn't. There was a sort of scrunching noise and bits of plaster and cement came raining down. Hadn't you better stop now, Grandma, George said. Daddy's just had this whole room repainted. But there was no stopping her now. Soon her head and shoulders had completely disappeared through the ceiling and she was still going. George dashed upstairs to his own bedroom and there she was coming up through the floor like a mushroom. Whoopee, she shouted, finding her voice at once. Hallelujah, here I come. Sitting on, Grandma, George said. With a hay, with a hay, noddy no, and up we go, she shouted. Just watch me grow. This is my room, George said. Look at the mess you're making. Terrific medicine, she cried. Give me some more. She's dotty as a donut, George thought. Come on, boy, give me some more. Dish it out, I'm slowing down. George was still clutching the medicine bottle in one hand and the spoon in the other. Oh, well, he thought, why not? He poured out a second dose and popped it into her mouth. She screamed and up she went again. Her feet were still on the floor downstairs in the living room, but her head was moving quickly towards the ceiling of the bedroom. I'm on my way now, boy, she shouted, calling down to George. You just watch me go. There's an attic above you, Grandma, George called out. I'd keep out of there. It's full of bugs and bogles. Crash, the old girl's head went through the ceiling as, it, as, it, as though it were butter. George stood in his bedroom, gazing at the shambles. There was a big hole in the floor and another in the ceiling, and sticking up like a post between the, the two was the middle part of Grandma. Her legs were in the room below her, and the head in the attic. I'm still going, came the shrieky voice from above. Give me another dose, my boy. Let's not go through, let's go through the roof. No, Grandma, no, George called back. You're busting up the whole house. 
Tip with the house, she shouted. I want some fresh air. I haven't been outside for 20 years. By golly, she is going through the roof, George told himself. He ran downstairs. He rushed out of the back door into the yard. It would be simply awfully thought if she bashed up the roof as well. His father would be furious. And he, George, would be get the blame. He had made the medicine. He had given her too much. Don't, please, don't go through the roof, Grandma, he prayed. Please don't. The next chapter is called The Brown Hen, and we'll continue with that tomorrow. Hey, it's great that you've joined us for story time today. We'll be back again tomorrow. Look after yourselves. Have a great day. Kakite anō.